metastatic adenosquamous squamous carcinoma of the lung, metastatic to the wrist with apparent selection of squamous histology. So briefly, uh, this patient, when he was diagnosed, was 60 years old. Uh, he was a former smoker with about a 40-pack year history. Uh, he was diagnosed as 2A poorly differentiated adenocarcinoma. So just a little bit about his background. He did have a non-ischemic cardiomyopathy, um, and his EF was still OK. Uh, he had diabetes, he had hypertension, hyperlipidemia. Uh, we actually saw him initially as a, as a secondary consult, um, and we had recommended adjuvant therapy based on the JBR uh, data and the LACE meta-analysis. Uh, he then subsequently went back. Um, he did receive a slightly different um, regimen than was done in the JBR data. He received carbopem, uh, I think possibly because of the concern of his diabetes and maybe taxol-induced uh, neuro um, peripheral neuropathy. He tolerated it fairly well, but unfortunately, um, pretty quickly afterwards, about seven months after treatment, uh, he suffered a disease recurrence. Uh, this is biopsy proven, and now it was shown to be TTF1 positive, P40 positive, adenosquamous carcinoma. Uh, PET-CT didn't show any evidence of uh, uh, metastatic disease at that time, uh, and he came back to us for a second opinion and then transferred his care to our institution. And at that point, giving him the benefit of the doubt, uh, knowing that this was uh, locally recurrent, um, it was actually at the site of the surgical margin, um, we offered him definitive intent chemo radiation um, with carboplatin, weekly carboplatin and taxol uh, with uh, 60 gray radiation. Uh, molecular testing revealed uh, KRS mutation uh, G12A um, from Dr. Zoli's talk actually a few days ago. Uh, this is less commonly associated with smoking. It's only about 10% of the KRS mutations. Um, but uh, uh, no, uh, he was EGFR and alpha wild type at that time. Uh, unfortunately, a few weeks into treatment, he started developing pretty severe pain in his wrist. It was his non-dominant hand, but he couldn't help himself out of bed or get out of chair. Um, he was dropping objects, um, and eventually he couldn't sleep. Uh, so an MRI was performed, uh, which revealed this pretty aggressive 2.5 centimeter mass in the right second metacarpal, uh, extending into the musculature. Uh, the biopsy was done by FNA, by our orthopedic colleagues, uh, and this showed squamous cell carcinoma. Again, they tried to compare it to his prior adenosquamous. Uh, this was TTF1 negative, um, but they did note, obviously, that the limited sample size would, would uh, make diagnosis of an adenosquamous potentially uh, difficult. He then began uh, palliative XRT to the wrist, um, which unfortunately did not really um, alleviate his pain. Uh, he had increasing doses of narcotics. He was also not tolerating chemotherapy at that point. In and out of the hospital with sepsis, pneumonia, AFib, RVR. Um, and actually, during one of those hospitalizations, he turned to us and just said that he, uh, he didn't want this in his hand anymore, that he would rather have it amputated than go on. Uh, so just a quick point, given Dr. Um, Crawford's talk, uh, at this point, we obviously talked with him about the severity of his condition and why he wanted to go on. Um, and when we talk about financial toxicity, he actually was a small business owner. He ran his business by himself, and the reason he wanted to live longer was to teach his wife how to run his business so that she wouldn't be financially bereft after his death. Uh, so we um, agreed, our orthopedic colleagues agreed, and performed a form of uh, amputation. And actually, on post-op day two, his opiate doses were going down. He was awake. He was sleeping. He, he said he felt better than he had in months. Uh, I do just want to point out from the pathology, the upper left was showing poorly differentiated adeno, um, confirmed with mucin staining, which is relatively scant. Uh, C is sort of a borderline between adenocarcinoma on the left, and we see some squamous components on the right. And this is just the poorly differentiated squamous carcinoma with keratinization in the bottom right. So he unfortunately did uh, progress after that. He received a single agent dose of taxol, and then about that same time, nivolumab was approved. At this point, he technically had he was in that window between it was approved for squamous before adeno. Uh, he at that point was pretty much a diagnosis of squamous, and so he was approved for nivolumab. Unfortunately, he had a traumatic fall at home, and as per numerous discussions that we had had previously, he was not resuscitated. Uh, so just a few words about adenosquamous carcinoma. This is a relatively rare subtype of non-small cell lung cancer. Uh, depending on the case report, case series, 0.4 to 4 percent. Um, but even if it's 1 or 2 percent of all lung cancers, you're still talking to 2,500 to, uh, 2, to 5,000 patients a year. It is associated with male sex and smoking history. It has a strict definition of being composed of both 10 percent of the squamous and the adenocarcinoma components. And these patients tend to do worse um, than patients with adenocarcinoma or squamous cell. Uh, data on the mutational profile is limited, although it is pretty significant that when driver mutations are found, it's found in both the adenocarcinoma and squamous component, which argues for a similar um, derivation and origin. Um, adenocarcinoma, uh, adenosquamous carcinoma is also associated with higher levels of phenylate synthase, and this was brought up actually yesterday, I think, during Josh's talk, um, that part of the thought behind pamitrexa being less sensitive, uh, less effective in squamous cell carcinoma is because of the higher levels of phenylate synthase in those tumors. 
um, being that pemetrexid is a multi-target antifolate. Uh, so that leads me to the question of whether the pemetrexid given in the adjuvant setting maybe actually had a role in the, the, the sort of transition from a poorly differentiated adeno. Possibly that was most likely nanosquamous at the time, but diagnostic limited by, based on the slides that we had uh, towards uh, adenosquamous and then a, poor, and then a, a, a mostly squamous histology. Uh, the other question is you know, with this KRAS mutation, the KRAS mutation was on the primary tumor. It would be interesting if we're, we're trying to go back and actually test his metastatic site, if we could see that the predominantly squamous histology also shared that same mutation, it would argue again for a similar origin. Um, and as we saw again, I think in the talk by Josh, the KRAS mutation patient positives in his cohort, um, these patients do worse with pemetrexid as well. Uh, I'd be risk if I, remiss if I didn't mention the fact that the PET scan, of course, um, his hands were outside of the scanner, so uh, they didn't pick up the potential site of the of the wrist met. And although we don't perform bone scans routinely, we usually prefer PET scans. A bone scan in this case may have diagnosed his met or at least one month earlier and may have potentially saved him having to go through definitive intent chemo radiation. Uh, again, I mentioned the KRS tumor. And or this maybe even before surgery. Or exactly. Tumor. Exactly. And... Um, and then the challenge of diagnosing adenosquamous carcinoma, I think we're going to see more and more of it as the immune histochemistry is, is used more often. But on limited sample size, especially FNA, it's just uh, sampling bias is so strong that you might not be able to pick, these, pick up these tumors. Uh, so these are my references, and just thanks again for the opportunity to be here. Questions from the floor? Yeah. yeah I, I, I imagine that that will have the same theoretical in this issue of uh, um, heterogeneity, uh, where this is a, a patient who's had different morphologies, tumors, drugs, natural history, right. could a genotype that in the early stage, could a genotype, a you did genotype at first return to the genotype, the last, the most uh, contemporary tissue that's been consistently with the G12A, yeah. Genetic ARAP, so it's a good way to classify tumors. And I think reasonable to test for K-Rats at any point in the, in the natural history. It's so fundamental to the taxonomy. Um, As I mean, had the aggressiveness of his tumor and how quickly he recurred afterwards and then how quickly he deteriorated um, really took us by surprise. And, and I think maybe we wouldn't have been as aggressive initially if we had sort of foreseen that. Yeah, and I don't think it wouldn't have had practical value, but it would have had some value for uh, Again, distinguish multiple primaries versus one. Exactly. Exactly. It's also intriguing that he got he had an adenosquamous histology and he was given pemetrexid based regimen and when you did the initial biopsy it was a squamous cell right, recurrence. So, so the whether the whether whether choice of chemotherapy could have been different. Absolutely, especially in, uh, in the adjuvant setting when that's sort of extrapolated from I mean the JBR data was Penalbian and Cisplatin, so this was a sort of a you know, that regimen isn't technically um, the optimized regimen based on the data. Excellent. Thank well, you. Thank you.